The webinar will begin in one minute. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's university-based Child and Family Policy Consortium webinar. My name is Patricia Barton, and I'm the Consortium Coordinator and Senior Policy Associate at SRCD. We're excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Creating Co-Regulation Supports for Adolescents, What, Why, and How. Before I turn things over to our speakers, I want to say a few words about the consortium and about using GoToWebinar. The University-Based Child and Family Policy Consortium is a network of more than 25 university-based institutions, including centers, schools, departments, and programs that have an interest in child and family policy. We are organized around three main purposes. First, to share the latest findings and strategies for conducting policy-relevant research and to facilitate collaboration across our member institutions. Second, to encourage cross-disciplinary undergraduate and graduate training to support the next generation of child and family policy researchers and third, to foster effective translation between research, practice, and policy audiences. The consortium is run in collaboration with the Society for Research and Child Development and hosts a number of webinars each year on a variety of topics. If you are interested in learning more about the consortium, having your institution join the consortium, or if you would like to join our listserv, please see the information on this slide. Just a quick word before we begin about the technology we are using today. We are using GoToWebinar to host this webinar. All of the attendees are muted. If you have questions for the speakers, please use the question box on your screen to submit them. Today's webinar will be recorded. After it ends, I will be uploading it to SRCD's YouTube channel and we'll share that link with all registrants as well as the slides from today's presentations. And now I'm pleased to turn things over to Dr. Elisa Meyer to introduce today's topic and speakers. Thank you, Patricia. Can you go back to the first slide? Thanks. So, oh no, <laughs> the other direction. So, um, welcome to today's webinar, um, creating co-regulation supports for adolescents. What, why, and how? The one before this. My name is Alita Meyer, and I'm the team lead for community engaged in American Indian Alaska Native Research at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. My office is within the Administration for Children and Families (ACF) an agency you may be familiar with um, through programs like Head Start and TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. If you've ever had the chance to work with the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, which is also known as OPRE, you may also be familiar with this image on the cover slide. So OPRE has used this image of the hands and seeds for many years to communicate about our work. One thing you may notice in this image is how the hands are of an adult cradling the hands of a young child. That focus on early childhood and the role of adults has always been a great strength of ACF and OPRE. In today's webinar, we'd like to extend that frame of adult support beyond early childhood to adolescence. And so this is our disclaimer, and now let's go to the goals for today's webinar. So our hope for today's webinar is to tell you a story of applying a developmental framework to the human services programs of the Administration for Children and Families. This work began in 2013 as an effort to extend the developmental frame that ACF already took with its early childhood programs to its human services programs for adolescents, families, and adults. One of the things we've learned along this journey is the importance of strengthening the focus on caring adults and their role in promoting positive development. By caring adults, I'm referring to a very wide range of adults who care for and interact with children and youth across multiple contexts. For example, I'm including those who have multiple daily interactions over long periods of time, such as parents, caregivers, adult family members, teachers, and other caregivers. Caring adults also includes those who have frequent interactions, but over a shorter amount of time, such as mentors, coaches, and staff, 
to implement human service programs. Caring adults can also include those who have few interactions with any particular child or youth, but have interactions with a large number of children and youth, such as bus drivers, administrative staff, and cafeteria work, workers. We hope what, we're, what we present today encourages you to apply a co-regulation frame to what you do. Next slide. So to get us there, I'll begin by describing how conversations between my office, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, or OPRE, and ACF programs informed the development of the self-regulation and toxic stress theories. Next, Desiree Murray will explain theory and research on the interactive process of co-regulation, whereby caregivers, caring adults support positive youth development, so why. And then Allie Frey will share how she and her team synthesized and expanded on the research on co-regulation in adolescents and using a formative rapid cycle evaluation approach developed and tested on the ground strategies and training for all levels of staff in healthy relationship programming for youth. Next slide. So this is just a quick view of what the self-regulation and toxic stress might look like. It's kind of like you go to a website and you can go into a portal and there's different documents there. But let's go to the next slide. So the seeds of this series can be found in four big bushels. So if you remember back in 2011, there was a lot of excitement about toxic stress and how it provided a brain architecture frame for what developmental psychologists had known for a long time. What they had known for a long time, having observed and studied parent-child relationships across many years in many contexts, was that warm, supportive relationships are fundamental to children's healthy development. But what we saw happening with that toxic stress frame was that sometimes people would focus just on counting the trauma and adversity, counting adverse childhood experiences, for example, they would just focus on that part of the equation for toxic stress, rather than focusing on the role of supportive relationships and the amount of supportive relationships. For these reasons, many of us in OPRE, as the research office of ACF, were concerned with accurately communicating about toxic stress and how best to translate that to ACF programs. We also saw this moment in time with so much excitement about toxic stress as an opportunity to provide actionable steps or legs to the strengths-based orientation that ACF wanted to have towards its programs. We thought a lifespan perspective on human development and context could provide these actionable steps. And fourth, perhaps the strongest motivator for me was the desire to bring adolescence and young adulthood into the prevention conversation that brain science was stimulating for early childhood. Next slide. So here's a little bit of that conversation between OPRE and our program offices back from 2015. So we, when we wanted to apply this developmental frame, we spent a lot of time thinking about which developmental process to focus on. And that could be an entire story in and of itself to tell you how we got to self-regulation. But trust me that we delved deeply into the National Academy's report of 2009 on preventing mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders among young people and decided to focus on something that could focus across age groups and across health outcomes and mental health outcomes. So the next slide. So after deciding that self-regulation was a valuable developmental process on which to focus, we identified a team to work with on this. And that was a team led by Desiree Murray and Katie Rosenbaum at the Center for Child and Family Social Policy at Duke University. Our first order of business when we got together was to bring in the scope of this the process of self-regulation. And we did that by working towards an applied definition, one that would allow others to see what we were talking about when we said self-regulation. So that got us to move to enactment, to the action of self-regulation. And it also pushed us to be very clear about what self-regulation would look like at different ages. The definition, self-regulation is the act of managing thoughts and feelings to enable goal-directed actions. So for a preschool-aged child, that might look like being able to identify feelings or basic problem solving or being able to calm down. But for a high school-aged youth, that might look like having effective decision-making in the context of really strong emotion and peer influence or being able to use healthy coping strategies to manage stress or to be able to use empathy and concern for others to guide their own goals and decisions. Next slide. So the first three reports are right here. And what they do is this. 
very foundational. The first one lays out a story of self-regulation development from birth to young adulthood and makes it a continuous story. So instead of just stopping in early childhood and saying adolescence is important, it really tells the story all the way up to young adulthood. The second report looks at all the research that we could find both on humans and on animals, um, prospective and correlational research on the relationship between chronic stress, adversity, trauma, and the development of self-regulation. So that's report two. Report three is where we looked at all the existing um, interventions that focused on self-regulation or used self-regulation processes um, as their target um, from birth to young adulthood. And we identified 299 studies back in 2013. And that report three synthesizes those findings by age group and it also provides this incredible appendix if you're a nerd like me. Next slide. So we had lots of conversations about these findings with our colleagues in the Office of Head Start, in the Healthy Marriage Responsible Fatherhood Program, in the Office of Child Support and Enforcement, in um, Children's Bureau, and talked about what all the findings meant for existing ACF infrastructure. So instead of saying, let's create a bunch of new programs that are new and improved and lay those on top of and force ACF to change, which might is one way of going about it, we wanted to take what was already happening in ACF and strengthen it. And so that's report four. So next slide. The next slide is just a little bit of a taste of all the additional resources we created based on those first four reports. Those first four reports are thorough, based in solid science and theory, but they're long and they're detailed. They're written in plain language, but we also were asked to write a number of additional resources that would take those stories and tell different pieces and parts of those stories. And two of the stories, two of these briefs right here are attached to the meeting invite and they're really relevant to today's conversation. One, where we pulled out the story of co-regulation from birth through young adulthood, and really talked about what it looks like at each of those ages. And then the other one is in the second bunch and it's called Communicating Scientific Findings About Adolescence and Self-Regulation Challenges and Opportunities. And this brief talks about how often and easy it is when we're talking about self-regulation and brain science to kind of overlook adolescence and not pay attention and why is that? Um, and at the bottom of the page there's a it indicates that we created a number of snapshots and practitioner tip sheets, and two of those are attached here as well. So the next slide. So on this slide, what I want to explain to you is this is the process of co-regulation. So I'm telling you the what. Desiree's going to tell you the why. But it's created of these three things that a caring adults do. So building warm, responsive relationships, coaching self-regulation, and structuring the environment. And um, in our snapshots, we have both what's going on developmentally with youth in each of those six age groups, but we also tell you what does it look like when you're parenting to do these three things when your child's four and when your child's 11 and when your child's 16, and to really encourage people to plan ahead of time that I'm going to be doing the same kinds of things as a parent when my child's older that I'm doing now, and I need to be prepared ahead of time for what that looks like. Next slide, please. So as we did all this work, a number of gaps were identified in the research and in programs. It became quite apparent to us, and we talked with our colleagues about that in the next slide. And Ali Frey is going to talk with you in particular about a con the, this long conversation we have had with our colleagues in the Healthy Marriage Responsible Fatherhood programs about their request that instead of creating a better um, in a better curriculum that might do a, um, more clearly say what self-regulation looks like and hold together life skills, but to really to see what we could do to strengthen the co-regulation of the facilitators of those programs. And so that's what she'll be talking about next slide. But before she does that, we're going to spend some more time in the why. And so I'll hand it over to Desiree. Thank you, Alita. 
Um, it's nice seeing all our work put together like that. It reminds me how much work it actually was. So. <laughs> um, I want to add my thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm really pleased um, in particular at the interest from such a diverse audience. I'm and looking forward to some of uh, your questions at the end as, as, um, and also appreciated the questions that some of you submitted earlier. Just as way of brief introduction, um, I'm a senior research scientist um, here currently at um, the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, you'll also notice the icon for child trends, which is actually where I will be transitioning my work over the next year. Um, and as Alita mentioned, this work um, actually started several years ago um, with um, a team that I was working with um, at Duke. Um, briefly, my background is as a clinical psychologist by training and what I do um, currently, my current research is focused on developing and evaluating self-regulation interventions, primarily in schools, but also in, in other settings. So next slide. Um, so why do we think it may be helpful to focus on self-regulation with adolescents? Um, the first thing I would say is that this is really taking a strengths-based approach um, where we're thinking about what are the opportunities for building resilience. And that is, um, as one of the um, communications that Alita pointed out, um, is a little bit different from how communication in our society tends to go about adolescence. It tends to be focused a lot on deficits and risks. So I think that's the first thing about self-regulation that's a little bit different. Secondly, I think that um, focusing on self-regulation at least in the way that we've tried to do in our work, is really very intentionally trying to um, translate everything we have learned from developmental science in the last 10, 20 years and put that into a framework and language that um, programs and, and practitioners can actually use. Um, also, as Alita mentioned, self-regulation is developmental, and I think that's really important that we think about what kids need across the lifespan. Um, our, our work really, our, our charge from ACF was really to look from birth through young adulthood, and um, that was really valuable. And I think um, the, the more our models are applicable across age groups, I think the better job we're going to be able to do in supporting kids long term. We also have lots and lots of research showing us that self-regulation is malleable. We do have interventions that help, even if all of those interventions don't necessarily use the word self-regulation. We can actually, in fact, we did this, map those onto some of the key self-regulation constructs. So we know the interventions are effective. I'll tell you a little bit about where I think they could be more effective. Um, but really, most importantly to all this work, self-regulation is so clearly foundational to well-being, really across so many different domains, health, mental health, um, well-being, very broadly defined, income, educational attainment, and also is very predictive of um, risks in adolescence. And I think that's particularly relevant in this day and age when stress and suicide rates are actually rising in adolescence. Next slide. So I'm not going to read all these skills, but I did want to point out that um, there are so many different definitions of self-regulation and, and um, each sort of discipline um, has their own uh, definition. And so I thought it would be helpful to be um, specific about what we are talking about here in this presentation. And what we have focused on is really on the skills because our, our end point goal is again to sort of translate some of these ideas in this developmental science into something that can actually be used in working with um, adolescents in, in this case. Um, we can divide those skills into cognitive, emotional, and behavioral um, with the idea that those behavioral skills um, require both the cognitive and the emotional skills to be in place, but I certainly, we certainly do recognize that these things are all very interrelated and integrated. In fact, they should be, and in fact, the more that they are integrated, I think the better the functioning is, is going to be. And you can see as you look at this list, you can imagine how some of these things, delay of gratification, healthy coping skills, 
making those decisions that are in align with your own values as well as reflecting concern for others. You can certainly see how those play out in, in different outcomes really across many different domains. Next slide. So um, the key, some of you may have seen a very recently released report from the National Academies of Science called The Promise of Adolescence. Um, and um, I was able to get on that webinar and it was, it was really terrific. I would encourage you to follow up um, uh, and take a look at that as a resource. But one of the key messages in that work is that adolescence really is an opportune time for intervention. And again, I don't know that we've always thought that way, um, but we have learned so much in the last 10 to 15 years about brain development and in particular about plasticity across the lifespan. And one of the things that we have recognized and realized is that adolescence is probably the most active period of brain development after infancy. There's really significant major architectural changes going on. And I think part of what that means, again, through this lens of opportunity, is that there really are, it is a very good time to provide experiences and interventions that are going to support um, positive um, neural connections in the brain that build lifelong well-being. And really, um, you know, there's, there's some reason to think, there is some reason for optimism to think that we may even be able to do some rewiring from some early adversity that may have occurred. Um, secondarily, um, what we know from um, brain science with adolescents is that adolescents are really sensitive to rewards, even more so than kids and older adults. And I do think that's something important for us to pay attention to in our uh, interventions. Um, one of the things uh, that we know is extremely reinforcing is, of course, peers. And that's something we need to be thinking about. How can we leverage that, um, influence, and utilize um, rewards and incentives in a way that motivates healthy behavior choices for adolescents. I think there's a lot more we could be doing in that area. Um, another reframe is that risk seeking really does serve a developmental purpose. Um, it really is, um, in a way, evolutionary evolutionarily adaptive because without that um, sensation seeking, um, there would not be motivation for new experiences that are really um, critical developmentally for building skills. Um, and it is certainly true that the other thing we know um, about adolescent development is there is a heightened um, emotional reactivity or sensitivity. And um, again, part of how I like to frame that is that I think what that does is it really highlights um, just how important it is, um, how sensitive a period that is that um, in fact, um, intentional social emotional supports is something that we need to um, really be thinking about. Next slide. Another important aspect of adolescent self-regulation is understanding how stress makes it harder. Um, in our second report that Alita mentioned, we looked at almost 400 studies of stress and self-regulation and um, really just um, identified the impacts biological, social, emotional, behavioral, and I think what that report does, and there's certainly lots and lots of, of literature um, that, that, uh, that says this, is really how stress does get under the skin in terms of um, biological effects on a number of levels which are very clearly related to um, self-regulation. And toxic stress in particular, which is a construct some of you are probably familiar with, certainly makes it harder to regulate one's emotions. Um, it's harder to get calm after a stressor. Um, and part of what this means is that adolescents who live in adversity, um, disadvantaged backgrounds, um, certainly including most of those um, youth who would be served through ACF programs, um, they may have more trouble controlling impulses and delaying gratification. And again, I think the message is what that means is we need to figure out how to provide those additional supports. Um, and unfortunately, I think that um, uh, some of our youth serving systems actually add stress. Um, uh, that we certainly structural inequalities do that for youth from disadvantaged backgrounds, which can make it again even harder to self-regulate. So this is all part of us thinking about the broader context um, of how can we support youth. Next slide. 
And so this is sort of our, our Bronfenbrenner-esque uh, figure of um, all the different influences on um, sort of the likelihood that um, someone might self-regulate in any particular given situation. Um, and you can see that some of those are very individual, um, but that there are also many other influences. Um, in particular, of course, what we're focusing on today is the caregiver support um, and the, the co-regulation. Um, again, this is not, um, I do not want to, um, uh, to communicate that we don't think that focusing in on skills and skills instruction are important. In, in fact, they, they are, um, but that co-regulation is really an opportunity that is, I think, a missed opportunity that could be added for, um, as Alita likes to say, a full court press towards intervention. Next slide. So just to sort of loop back to um, what is co-regulation, um, it is this process by which caring adults, and Alita gave a really beautiful definition of all the different individuals we would define as caring adults. It is those day-to-day, moment-to-moment interactions with youth that support their self-regulation. And that is, includes both proactive sorts of things that they might do, um, as well as how um, uh, we as caring adults might respond um, during moments of distress. Um, Co-regulation is a term, um, I know some of you work more with younger kids, and so you may be more familiar with this term because I think that's where the literature has used this most often. I have seen it used much less um, in reference to adolescence, even though I think it's very applicable. Although there's some folks who are starting to talk about that now. And again, I, I think it ha it's a very useful term and again, a construct. So um, again, excited that you all were interested in, in um, hearing us talk about that. Um, okay, next slide. So this is a figure that Alita showed, and um, I just wanted to um, add to that. I'm going to sort of tell you about each of those three um, circles in a moment, but I wanted to um, just sort of highlight that um, this is a model that, again, came from um, the two, the really three different literature reviews that we did early on, and in particular, um, we had over a hundred parenting parenting studies primarily. There were some um, studies, uh, particularly for younger kids um, in schools, looking at teachers um, serving in a co-regulator role in particular. Um, but most of the studies were parenting studies, and it was very clear the link between self-regulation, self-regulation development, and positive discipline strategies, the sensitivity of those adults, the routines, and the relationship. Um, and so um, those things very clearly stood out to us, and um, that sort of, um, uh, we, we put those together in this model um, in, in a way that we thought might be, might be helpful. Um, I will also comment um, that we do not have peers in this co-regulation model. And again, that isn't to minimize the potential positive self-regulation influence that friends and, and close intimate partners, I think, can have. Um, but we don't actually think of co-regulation as the peers' job, um, given that they have their own developmental needs. So we can we can certainly come back to that in Q&A if folks would want, are interested in that particular question. All right, next slide. So um, in some of the questions that uh, some of you submitted ahead of time, you asked about, well, how does co-regulation for adolescents differ for younger kids? And so here's one of the slides or figures that um, addresses that a little bit. Um, so you can see over the course of development on the, on the bottom um, horizontal line there, sort of looking at Generally, we think that self-regulation um, increases as we get older, which is a good thing for most of us. It doesn't, it doesn't increase in a, in a linear way, um, and um, there are two times where it increases rapidly. One, of course, is early childhood, and the other, as we know from current developmental science, is in adolescence, particularly around early adolescence, but really throughout. 
Um, another thing I would point out here is that um, the self-regulation really never reaches what we sometimes talk about as having a full bucket. Um, and um, I would argue that really even for any age adult, there's always times and situations where it's hard to keep your perspective and emotional balance without a loved one supporting you. And that's sort of what we're talking about here in terms of that that co-regulation, even if it doesn't look like a, a caregiver uh, per se, formally. Um, the other thing I want to point out about this model is that there, there is, this model does not reflect just a huge amount of um, developmental variability and individual variability that um, adolescents have in their own um, self-regulation skills. And so I do think we need to take in, that into consideration, especially if um, those of you who work with um, youth from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, it may be harder for them to develop those skills. And so part of what that means is that we as adults need to provide um, increased co-regulation supports, maybe perhaps more than we might think of based upon sort of a normative developmental model. Okay, next slide. So these are data from our review of almost 300 self-regulation interventions um, across development. Um, and what we looked at is we tried to categorize those as interventions that just focused on teaching skills, interventions that really were just about the, um, the caregiver. Again, most of those were parenting, some of those were um, teacher focused, whether they did both of those things or a few studies that did neither. And so I want to point out here, which you may not be surprised to see. So if, if you follow the blue bar, you'll see that it, it increases with age, which makes sense. So um, as youth get older, um, more and more of the programs that we have seem to focus on skills instruction, so that makes sense. But the but what happens, which is a little bit more concerning and actually something that we think is a research graph, gap, excuse me, and I believe that's one of the um, attachments that we um, included um, for this webinar also. So if you look at the red bars, you can see that really um, after preschool, um, even if you add up the red and the green, because the green it includes skills as well as co-regulation, it's actually um, after the preschool age, it's less than half. And you can see when you start to get to middle school and high school that there's really just a handful of programs that are um, uh, actually um, working very intentionally to provide skills in um, uh, some sort of uh, educational way to those caring adults. So we really think that that's a way that we could strengthen interventions. Next slide. And this is just a look at one of the snapshots that, again, I believe that you all have in this um, uh, attached to the webinar resources. Um, so in 78 studies of middle school, the first thing in, in general, I would say if you look at sort of the column that says average effect size, um, we are by and large um, and in several areas seeing some positive effects. Um, certainly in cognitive self-regulation, language learning, delinquency, um, health, mental health, um, more than half the studies, well more in some of those domains are showing positive effects, generally with the small effect size range, which is what we tend to see in prevention research but um, certainly room for improvement. And I circle the three areas where the greatest amount of um, room for improvement exists. And I think those are pretty important areas, what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, emotional development and emotional reactivity in adolescents and seeing that only 22% of the studies we looked at, now granted that was only through 2013, but I don't think it's tremendously changed um, in the last five years, um, we could do a whole Whole lot better. Um, we can also do a whole lot better in terms of um, first off doing more research um, looking at stress and self-regulation um, and um, uh, as well as um, related to motivation. So I think there's definitely areas we could we could do um, do better with. So going back to um, uh, the co-regulation and how can we think about improving outcomes from for kids by um, adopting a co-regulation framework. So the first of those um, circles is about relationships. Um, so um, as you all um, know, um, all learning and special, especially emotional learning occurs in the context of supportive relationships. Um, 
adolescents, those of you who work with them know they're especially sensitive to when adolescents are genuine or not. And they have pretty strong ra radars for when we say one thing and do another. So the most important thing here, I think, is genuinely listening and caring, even when teenagers are sometimes being completely illogical and provocative. Um, it really is about keeping our cool as the adults so we can respond rather than react when they're dysregulating. Um, and we can focus on their efforts and, and intentions, not just what they happen to do or, or fail to do. There's also one difference, I think, in working with adolescents is that we do, um, they have some pretty strong developmental needs around identity, autonomy, and a sense of agency. So we do want to recognize and support that. Um, at the same time, they need that guidance and checking in, perhaps more of that than we think they do, but hopefully in ways that are matched to their needs. Next slide. So self-regulation coaching, that's really where skills are taught in the moment. Um, and again, um, uh, I think in the moment with, in relationship to an adult that the adolescent respects and feels understood and, and supported by. Um, we use the term coaching here because it really, it's sort of like what coaches might do to teach a sports skill. They model, they prompt the skill when it's needed, they provide supportive feedback or encourage self-reflection, and when things haven't gone well, they give a fresh, a fresh start. Um, other sorts of co-regulation co actions involve um, simply adults um, showing and, and perhaps even narrating, describing out loud what they're doing um, to manage their own emotions and stress. Those sort of models, um, adolescents certainly learn more about what they see you do than what they hear you say to do. <laughs> um, um, in situations where adolescents are becoming um, upset or dysregulated, um, I think one of the things that we as adults can do is we may actually be more in tune with that than they are and can kind of help them be aware of their own emotional thermometer. So if they need to press the pause, we can help them be aware of that and maybe give them the time and space to do so. Next slide. So building supportive environments. So the third component is, um, well, we know that this is really critical for any kind of positive development we're talking about. And this is where I think we really need to take a look at it as a society, as um, what we can do from a public health perspective. So if you look at the um, picture on the right, this is toxic chemicals pouring into the air. Um, and this is, could, really could be a metaphor for toxic stress in um, experiences of many youth in their development. We can spend an awful lot of time trying to teach youth skills um, and, and also work with adults to um, in how they interact and maybe buffer some of that stress. But I'll never forget when we were first talking with Ken Dodge early on in this, in this work um, that sometimes one of the most effective things we can do is actually take a step back and think about addressing the source of stress. So I wanted to just to put that out there for us. Um, for example, we could think about in terms of social policies, what can our policies do that can focus on creating culture and norms that value and promote self-regulation, which is, I think, um, different from many messages um, that um, adolescents receive now in our country, certainly from social media. Um, we could also have policies that reduce excessive self-regulation demands um, and um, ensure that youth are um, in safe and supervised settings um, and to make sure that the stress is not at a level that's overwhelming for any, any individual um, adolescent. Um, just like with younger kids, those routines and expectations are important. And um, I think there's a lot of places where adolescents are both in school and out of school that we could, again, do more to build some of those intentional self-regulation supports. Um, and thinking about the incentives, as I mentioned earlier, um, I will add that um, with incentives and sort of behavior systems, especially if we think about youth who maybe are um, living in um, other situations, let's say foster care homes or residential treatment, that um, I think 
it is certainly helpful to hold youth responsible for their poor choices, but that doesn't mean that we're trying to make them pay for their crime. Um, it means we actually want to give them opportunities to learn from their mistakes. And that's something that we can think about in systems like our schools and, and other places where, where we work with youth. Okay. Um, one more important point here is about how important adult self-regulation capacity is. Um, I've been talking about all the things we want adults to do to support youth self-regulation, and um, this is certainly um, can be hard, especially adults who work in high burnout and underpaid professions, whose job is supposed to be to help youth, but they're really um, as stressed out themselves. Um, I think Allie's going to talk about this in a few minutes. Um, this is really the idea of dual generation sort of interventions, but again, something I don't think we're doing enough to think about with adolescents. Um, and some of the things that I know that we've been working on in a program I'm developing for middle schoolers is incorporating mindfulness and some very clear stress management supports um, for the adults so that they can do the kinds of things we're talking about. All right, my last, um, I think the last slide I'm gonna talk about here is um, how, how does this co-regulation approach we're talking about, how does this connect to other intervention approaches? There's certainly um, lots of similarities with other parent ma management approaches, although we don't have a lot of those for adolescents. I think what may be a little bit different is we're talking about adopting a really explicit self-regulation framework that I think could be integrated into a lot of existing programs. We're also really talking about promotion rather than treatment um, per se, not that these couldn't be integrated into treatment programs. Um, and it really is more than building relationships. Again, there's similarities with some mentoring programs, but our focus is really systematic and intentional, and we're really paying attention to caregivers' own abilities. Um, there's certainly other treatment programs that address some of these same things, but oftentimes those programs are not as accessible to the families we, um, who really need them in the way that we would like them to be. Um, so my last slide is just a summary. I will stop here because I think I'm over my time and pass it along to Allie. Thanks so much, Desiree. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Allie Fry. I am the project director of a pro project called Self-Regulation Training Approaches and Resources to Improve Staff Capacity for Implementing Healthy Marriage Programs for Youth, SARAM. And I'm going to use that project to describe one example of how we can take this example of co-regulation and apply it on the ground using processes developed with and for frontline staff and their supervisors who work with adolescents. But also we can use this in our own personal lives as parents um, or you know, friends and family of adolescents. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so the SARAM project is uh, in the context of relationship education programs, and I'm going to share a little bit about what those programs are. But one of the unique features of SARAM is that it does not target youth directly. Although adolescents are the recipients of the interventions that provide the context for our project, SARAM is focused on the staff who work with the adolescents. Uh, you know, staff or adult self-regulation skill and knowledge is often presumed, but not often nurtured, especially in the workplace. And so it is, um, you know, as you've heard from Alita and Desiree, it's in our interactions, how we relate and co-regulate with youth that we really believe uh, holds the most compelling mechanism for change. So SARAM's goal is to improve staff capacity for co-regulation and the measurement thereof. So we do have a measures development component to this project when working with youth 14 to 24 year old in HMRE programs. Next slide. So throughout this project, we're hoping to address the gaps or another way of saying it is just building a bridge between science and practice um, to help communicate that all adolescents need self-regulation supports from adults, especially those affected by adversity and trauma. And then we wanna share how to apply that framework on the ground in, in whatever your context may be. And then um, I'm not gonna spend much time today talking about the measurements, but there is a component of our project where we're developing and piloting self-regulation and co-regulation measures to use in the field. Uh, so keep an eye out for that uh, in publications uh, through OPRE. Next slide, please. 
So how did we do this? What was the strategy that we used, research strategy for SARAM? Um, it's very unusual. It was an innovative process. It was a collaborative and co-creative prototype development and piloting project. So uh, instead of a top-down approach to creating interventions that might work in different contexts, but they might not, um, <laughs> or as Alita said, instead of creating a new curriculum, SARAM uses a collaborative design process through a formative rapid cycle evaluation, evaluation research methodology to develop and test co-regulation training and strategies with and for the sites that we tested them in. Our process was informed by evidence and it was used to build evidence. It's anchored in this analytical method. So we use this method to learn about the evidence in the context so we understood the programs, we understood the literature. Then we partnered with programs to learn about their needs and their goals related to self and co-regulation. Then together, we developed co-regulation strategies to test in the field. And we did that by piloting them in three cycles. And after each cycle, we debriefed how it went, how was the strategy, did it achieve the goals that we set for it, and what do we need to do to improve the strategy? And then we tested it again and again. Um, so really fun, opportunity to continue to innovate and iterate on the kinds of things we were doing on the ground. Because we first focused on implementing and integrating or piloting these strategies in real time with real staff, the exciting part is that what emerges can be sustained and it can be scaled because it works in the field. Also, just like co-regulation, our process really put people in relationships at the center. So we engaged all levels of program staff so that uh, it wasn't just the supervisors telling the frontline staff what to do, it was everybody at the table. Um, and we would ask questions instead of saying, hey, do this a better way, we would say, here is the concept we're hoping to integrate. What about this strategy works or doesn't work toward that goal? And this explicit effort to understand what works for whom, under what circumstances, through a process that facilitates research to practice partnerships, that builds the local capacity and that promotes the sustainable change in ownership. Next slide. So a tiny bit about the context, and Alita shared some of this already. Um, the context for our project was healthy marriage and relationship education programs for youth. They are funded by grants from the Administration for Children and Families Office of Family Assistance. The first cohort of grantees was funded in 2006. The current cohort funded in 2015 for five years. There's about 30 grantees in the current cohort that provide services to youth and young adults between 14 and 24. That's our project's target range, uh, age range. And the thing is that there's this really important opportunity to support adolescent self-regulation development as a stepping stone for healthy relationships. So using the two contexts together um, was just a fantastic natural opportunity to test these strategies on the ground. So these relationship education programs provide youth with information and skills that help them develop healthy romantic relationships and avoid adverse experiences. So the contents like um, typically develop, uh, delivered in group workshops using standardized evidence-based or evidence-informed curricula with whole group instruction and interactive activities. Um, the curricula include content on self-awareness, goal setting, clarifying your own values, understanding the research on characteristics of strong relationships. Um, then they teach skills, communication skills, problem solving, anger management, avoiding escalation, sexual consent, navigating social media, and so on. Um, so they're delivered over 10 or 12 sessions in high school classes like health or family consumer science classes, or they might be done in community-based settings like at boys and girls clubs or youth shelters, um, or even agencies providing services for youth in foster care. In those community settings, sometimes programs are able to offer one-on-one -on -one coaching or case management, which makes it a really nice way to test workshop-based strategies and one-on-one-based strategies. Next slide. Just to showcase two of our program partners who helped us with this work, um, we have five partners total. Three of them are testing measures with us in the field, and these two sites are testing our co-regulation strategies. Um, they're very different from each other. The first is Children's Harbor in Pembroke Pines, Florida, and they operate a program called True North for youth aged 20, 18 to 23 who are aging out of foster care. And their staff, who are all female, um, are called navigators, and they provide a series of group workshops on relationship education in residential and non-residential settings, and they use a curriculum called Love Notes. 
um, they integrate some stuff on financial literacy and employment as well. And um, so this is a targeted group of young adults where we're testing strategies. The second site is More Than Conquerors in Atlanta, Georgia, and they teach the relationship education classes to ninth grade youth in four metropolitan high schools. Their curriculum is called Relationship Smarts Plus, and they come in and teach during health or PE classes over about 12 weeks. And, you know, classes are an hour or an hour and a half. So this is a universal group of adolescents, and interestingly, at More Than Conquerors, most of their staff are male. So next slide. Let's get to um, where the rubber meets the road. So based on Desiree and Alita's work, and informed by our own literature review, we developed this model of co-regulation to guide our work with the program. So this model, which is still in process, it kind of takes the model that was that you saw earlier to the next level by depicting the way that the domains of adult co-regulation work collectively to support youth self-regulation in the center of the triangle. An important component of the SARM model reflects the literature that we've discussed, which says that in order to be effective co-regulators, we need to be sure our own oxygen mask is on first. So as you see in the upper left, the fuel for our co-regulation is our own adult self-regulation enactment. Not only was the need for adult self-care and self-regulation clear in the literature, but the staff at our sites began to express the desire to enhance their own regulation. This came up almost every time we met with them. Staff would communicate, hey, if I come to a workshop or an interaction with youth and I'm frustrated or I'm stressed or I'm tired, maybe I'm wrought with implicit bias or I'm lacking my own skills, obviously that's gonna affect the quality of the interaction with youth. But they became more aware of that. Um, and, and they became aware of how it affected their ability to model self-regulation enactment for youth. So as staff learned about the role of regulation in relationship health and well-being, they then began to have an increased awareness of their own dysregulation. And as they noticed their own tendency for dysregulation, they could see it in the youth as well. And then the magic happened. Their lens began to shift from seeing youth behavior as malicious or deviant to just seeing it as dysregulation. That shift made it possible for staff to see these behaviors not as offenses to punish, but opportunities to connect, to empathize, to enhance support, scaffold, coach. This new lens, this co-regulation lens, began to shift the onus of responsibility from the kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps model to the what can I do to mirror what this young person needs? How can I coach them? When we first shared the domains of the model, we often heard, oh, I'm already doing this, or our program is really great at that. We're totally focused on building warm relationships. And they were. But as we worked with, ongoing, with staff ongoing, they began to see that the power of the model isn't in the individual domains. It's in the collective impact when all of these pieces are synchronized together. So our co-regulation strategies included staff-level strategies and strategies to use in interactions with youth. Next slide. So here I've pulled the domains out of the co-regulation model. So you can see the bulleted strategies we developed and tested um, as they're you know, next to their primary domain targeted. Now remember, we didn't change the program or the curriculum. We trained staff to overlay these co-regulation strategies onto their regularly scheduled programming. They were super intentional, very explicit. We developed a, model, a module to teach each one and they were piloted as a package, a suite of micro interventions, if you will. I'm not gonna go through each one, but I'll share a sample of them. And you can keep your eye out for our series for practitioners where you'll be able to access these modules for your own use in the, in the future. Um, so staff strategies included things like noticing exercises to help staff tune into the way their bodies felt in different settings at different times of the day. What might that tell them about what they value or need, what they might do next? Amazing how little staff are taught to focus on this kind of thing, and yet, uh, and it's no surprise that interventions for youth don't focus on emotion regulation because we as staff or adults often didn't have that ourselves. Um, another was personal goal setting, where staff partnered with other peers in their uh, workplace to support each other in personal goals, not professional goals, personal goals. And this changed the culture of the work environment towards increased support of personal self-care and kind of created a co-regulation model in, in the workplace among staff. And then for youth-based strategies, we have one example is a welcoming strategy. So, you know, you're standing at the front of your classroom preparing to teach. 
we turned that on its head and we said, okay, do that before you come to the classroom. Now our welcoming strategy has three parts. The first is that facilitators are positioned at the door to greet each youth at the beginning of every class. It turned out that you started wanting to be that, to get that high five before class or to have someone say their, their, their own name as they walked into the room. It set the tone for the workshops. And then there was a three question worksheet that we developed where, um, and this was really for youth more than it was for the facilitator, but it asked three questions. One, um, what was your, what's your preferred name? Two, something I'd like you to know about me is, and the youth would fill in the blank, and then they were to finish the sentence. In class, I like it when you. And honestly, it shifted the tone, it shifted this, the youth's perception. This class is different. This facilitator cares. So you can see how we're really leveraging that warm relationship development there. And then we had a third piece of welcoming, which was a brief one-on-one -on -one check in um, of one or two students per class where the facilitator would come up to a, a student and say, hey, I heard your grandma was sick. I'm thinking about you. Is there anything you need? And so forth. So just one on one. Another strategy example is praise. Praise is something we hear a lot about, but the nuts and bolts of effective praise are not often broken down clearly. Our positive praise strategy builds on the science of motivation and positive behavioral supports, leverages what we know of Embry and Biglin's work on evidence-based kernels, um, and we taught facilitators how to praise, the characteristics that make praise effective, what to be praising, when to be praising. We tested two types of praise strategies, one for verbal praise in class and one for written praise. And it was a slam dunk, people loved it. Um, and what was so amazing is that during the, the, the formative rapid cycle evaluation, staff began to see how they could influence peer interactions how they could really shift the climate of the class and individual behavior using these positive strategies, which reduced their stress, made their work more satisfying. Um, Co-regulation began to replace reprimands and youth told us that the students, that, that the strategies created a safe space for them where everyone got a chance to participate and different opinions were respected. And then students started to see, I could apply this outside the classroom, that's cool. Next slide, please. We like to say that we applied the model of co-regulation in SEREM at two levels, and this slide really hits at those two levels. The first was co-regulation training, and that's not as obvious. And the second was the co-regulation strategies, you know, the things we're testing in the field. So in the first, we used the model of co-regulation in our every interaction with our sites. This is how we trained, co trained staff, coach staff, our ongoing relationship with them hinged on the co-regulation model. Staff um, received about four hours of training on self-regulation, adolescent brain development, co-regulation, um, the, the model to deepen their knowledge. And then we had regular week weekly coaching calls with supervisors and sometimes with frontline staff where we provided warm encouragement. We talked about how things were going, what they saw how they could see co-regulation at work. We used and modeled every domain through these coaching calls um, and asked probing questions. Things like, what do you notice when you observe staff youth relationships? Can you tell that they're warm? How can you tell that they're warm? Can you see that, sen that sense that youth are feeling known, have a sense of belonging? How do you see that? What specifically are you looking at? And it just changed the frame that uh, staff had when working with youth. Um, we then in the second, you know, the co-regulation strategies level, we really explained the importance of practicing, planning, and reflection. So often when we get in front of a class um, or when youth begin to dysregulate, we start talking more <laughs> when what we really need to do is listen. So, you know, um, instead of solving challenges for staff, we asked staff what got in the way of practice time or reflection time, and we would collectively brainstorm ideas. Because we had ongoing intention around integration of our co-regulation framework, and because we used coaching and bi-directional feedback, we had great success. Some of our biggest strategy critics are now some of our strongest champions. Next slide. So if there's anything that we hope you can take from today's presentation, it's this. 
Regardless of your professional title, you are uniquely positioned to serve as a co-regulator for a young person or many young people in any interaction anywhere you find yourself. This can apply to individual interactions, but it can also apply to the lens with which you view your work and the interventions you pursue. We as caring adults have power and responsibility that we, we can unintentionally inhibit or defer to other professionals or other systems or worse, to youth themselves. <laughs> And this presentation is about shifting that lens so that we're aware of our importance and our impact, our lifeline-like nature of our roles in the lives of young people. So I invite you to consider how you might integrate the model of co-regulation into your work or your program or your research. And what will you do differently because of this information? And as you ponder that, I'll turn back over to Alita to, for some closing remarks. Okay, so I just wanted to share quickly that SARM is just one example of the ongoing conversations that we're having in ACF on co-regulation supports in adolescents. So here are two examples. One is with our colleagues who work in um, with family foster care, so um, promising directions and research gaps in building the capacity of foster care systems to support self-regulation in youth and young adults. And then in June, um, Allie and I will be presenting at the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Grantee Conference about improving program and staff capacity to support adolescent self-regulation. Next slide. So there are many next steps to the works. So there's things that we're doing. There's things that you can do. And um, please email Desiree if you're interested in getting involved in a co-regulation, adolescent co-regulation interest group. Her email is right here on this page. And um, in the next slide. Um, I think is, I don't know if we have any time for questions, probably don't, but um, Patricia? If you want to take one. Okay. One. How about that? All right. So, Allie? Sure. So, uh, one of the questions that we had at the front end was, what are what are some ideas for how to help the adolescent population with age-appropriate regulation activities at home, at school, and in the community? Alita, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think that this would be an example of that full court press where if we could get everybody to think that it's their job to help support self-regulation, just like we think that it's everybody's job to support reading um, for all age groups and in all contexts. And um, so, if we could get everybody to be thinking about, as an adult, I have an important role in every youth and child's life in having a warm relationship, helping to maybe reflect on how things happened and if it was in line with what they wanted and structuring the environment. So not just the teachers and not just parents, but everybody. And there's our contact information. Great, great. Thank you so much to everyone uh, who was able to join us today, especially thank you to our speakers for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, you might be interested in future consortium webinars. So the next one will be on June 10th, and the topic will be developing, implementing, and evaluating an evidence-informed supervised visitation program for child welfare involved parents. Um, so you can see more information on this slide and information about this webinar will also be sent around in the follow-up message. Um, you can also join the consortium listserv to receive notifications about future webinars, a quarterly newsletter, as well as job and event announcements. And as I mentioned earlier in my follow-up email, I will attach a copy of today's slides as well as a link um, to the recording of today's webinar, which will be posted on SRCB's YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Thank you again to everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.